Welcome to Vista Talks, interesting discussions with interesting people from all around the world. Hello and welcome to Vista Talks, interesting discussions with interesting people from around the world. I'm your host for today, Priscilla Charles, and I'm joined in studio by Sheila Castillo. Sheila is a postdoctoral researcher at the ADAPT Center Dublin. You're very welcome, Sheila. So um, let's move on and get on to the show. So Sheila, um, tell us a bit about your background. Uh, I understand you've studied linguistics and English language and the literature, but you also worked as an English teacher. So really what we'd like to know is what led you to follow this, this path, this languages, um, linguistic path? Like, can you take us through your background all the way up to your current position at the ADAPT Center? Yeah, sure. It's a, it's a bit of a long story. <laughs> <laughs> so I started uh, studying linguistics and English literature and um, I really loved English language. And um, so I was studying to become a teacher. And when you're a teacher in Brazil, there is always some kind of translation work that comes to you, you know. So a few um, students come and say, can you translate that for me or can you do that? And I really take like, I really like on uh, doing translations. And then when I finished my undergrads, I said like, maybe I want to do a master's on translation. So I was looking for a master's in translation in Brazil. But then uh, actually a student of mine say, there is this um, program called Erasmus Mundus that you can apply. And then I have I had a look at it. And then there was a, a course on natural language processing. And I was like, what? Wow, that sounds interesting. What is that? And then when I, I looked at the, the, the modules that they had, they had something called machine translation. And then I say, wow, it's translation but it has machine together. That sounds so interesting. I'll apply for it. And then I applied and then I started doing the masters on something absolutely new to me. It was very challenging, but I fell in love with machine translation straight away. So then after I finished the masters, I decided that I, I needed to do a PhD on that. So then I came to Dublin and I did my PhD here in DCU and um, all machine translation as well. And when I finished it in 2016, I went straight to uh, become a postdoc researcher. And I've been a postdoc since, um, so for two years now, working on machine translation evaluation and, um, you know, translation technologies in general. Okay, great. And so where did your passion for languages come from in the first place? Because you, you, you study linguistics and translation, but did you, how many languages did you speak before that? Fluently. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I speak a few, but fluently, I, I, I say that I speak just my mother tongue in English because the other ones is always like, it's not, it, it's not so natural. Uh, you know what I mean? It's not something that I use every day, but I can get by with most of the Latin languages like Spanish, uh, Italian and French. Um, but I think, to be honest, I started liking linguistics a lot since I was a kid. I loved reading. I read so much. And when um, I started learning English at school, I decided that that was something that I wanted to do. I really loved English and I wanted to speak another language. So I think it's just something that you know, you, you figure out as you grow up. I, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a sort of passion yeah, that you yes, develop and yes. you I loved you connect. listening to music in English and I wanted to understand what they were saying. And I couldn't because I didn't want to sing like, you know, everybody else when you don't know what you're singing. <laughs> the lyrics. Yeah, <laughs> so I went for the lyrics and I started to, actually, I started to doing kind of a machine translation there, but, it, you know, with my brain, I had the lyric and then I had a translation and I start, you know, inputting the data in my <laughs> brain to learn so yeah that's great yeah. that's that's a good way of putting it yeah yeah i suppose um uh, a lot of uh, non-native um, english speakers would have tried to do this you know yeah. learning from um from uh, from movies and songs yeah and, because yeah. you learn what you you like you, l you yeah. learn it faster if you like it yeah. yeah so if you have a passion for movies or music i think you would you know you you learn because you want to not because you're told to do so yeah, that's great. Absolutely, I totally, completely agree. <laughs> so, um, so now you're um, so now you're in Dublin and you're part of a team of researchers at the Adapt Center, right? Yes. Which I understand is part of um, Dublin City University. Yes. Uh, yes. So the Adapt Center, uh, we are in four universities. So it's Dublin, Trinity, DIT, and UCD uh, so far. Uh, 
but yeah, so uh, but I, I work in Dublin City University. Yeah. Okay, and um, and you've been working on a variety of projects in the past few years, yeah. and they both involve machine translation, right? Yeah, apparently I am the machine translation evaluation person. <laughs> <laughs> You're the expert in this yes. world. <laughs> and so, um, so the one that you're currently working on is the IADAA TPA for Intelligent Automatic Domain Adapted Automated Translation for Public Administration. Yes, if so I'm it's, correct. Yeah, it's a very hard name. <laughs> uh, we call it uh, IADATPA. IADATPA. Uh, yeah, okay, it's right. very hard to say. Yeah, yeah. This is the the. Um, Uh, latest one that I've been working since uh, January, th no, February this year. And uh, so uh, what we're trying to do, we're trying to build um, machine translation systems uh, to deal with legal documentation for the European Commission. And my part is to evaluate to see if the, all the systems that are built in the project are of good enough quality. So that that's what my my group does in DCU. We we evaluate the, the systems um, so we can prove that they are good enough for what they are building for they are built for. Okay. So have they they've already been tested? Are they is it has it started already? Oh no, we were in, in the middle of the of it. So we're uh, running a few experiments. We're sending out uh, the translation to to translators so they can uh, evaluate, you know, how fluent or how adequate in the grammar. Uh, so, but we are just in the middle of it. We don't have any results so far. Okay, and uh, how many languages will it involve? For uh, the. I adapt. Uh, I I don't quite remember, but I think it's a quite a few languages, including um, very low resource languages like uh, Catalan and Basque. So we're we're working on that as well. Uh, I think we're working quite a few. Even Irish, uh, we also working on. Um, but I don't remember. I quite, don't quite remember the number. Sorry, <laughs> I remember the number of uh, MT systems we have, which is like around 40. Uh, but the languages sometimes they overlap, so it can it could be and then, but you see, every machine translation is built for one specific language pair. So if I have a machine translation system from English into Irish, that's one, and then I need another one if I want to translate the opposite. So then Irish into English, and then that's a second machine translation. So I we have 40 so far. But I don't remember the number of language pairs. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Do you know if um, if there's any plan to develop more more pairs than, than those? Because I understand that you would have, you know, um, like well-known languages. Um, I know such as German or or a Mandarin or a Spanish or Portuguese. But what about like as you said, you talked about some languages can that are not I wouldn't say dialects, but are less used, you know, so you're talking yeah. about Basque and you know, yeah. so what about, um, for instance, I don't know, dialects or languages that are not as used? Yeah, I think the intention of the project is to work to as many European languages as possible. So everything that European Commission considers as one of their languages, we, we're willing to uh, to work with. Uh, and sometimes in some of the projects, I'm not sure if in this one that I'm working now, they um, like to work with uh, Greek languages, you know, like uh, from like um, 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 Chinese and Russian and these other languages that are, are spoken widely around the world. Uh, but uh, generally, European Commission projects wants to work with all European languages. Yeah, it makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's great. So and so now speaking of machine translation, so you'll be we we talked early on about your latest paper that you'll be presenting um, um, at the third conference on machine translation this October in Brussels. Yeah. And so your paper, I understand, is uh, on the reassessment of human parity claims over the Microsoft neural machine translation. Yeah. And uh, and this publication is the result of a partnership between the Adapt Center and the University uh, in the Netherlands, right? Yes. 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 Um, so this paper, we came up with the idea because um, Microsoft and a few other big companies, they have released a few claims in the past year uh, saying that they either have reached human parity or they have cracked uh, one of the language pairs or they have bridged the gap between human and machine translation. and. Um, But only Microsoft uh, released the data that they used to do those claims. So we decided to take the data and run our own experiments, uh, with, but with a few modifications that we thought it was important to 
you know, to really assess the quality. Um, so what we found out is that there was a problem with the reference translated translation. So I don't know if uh, anyone is uh, um, acquainted on how we evaluate machine translation. There are a few ways to do it. But one of the ways is that we need a human reference to compare the quality of our machine translation systems, right? Uh, so the human reference for that experiment, we saw that it was not of good quality. So every time that uh, translators were um, asked to compare the human translation, I'm going to call it reference because we say human translation, but sometimes we're not sure if it was a human translation. Okay. So, yeah. So every time we ask the translators to compare the the reference against the machine translation output, sometimes they would prefer the machine translation output. But some of the times it was because the reference was not good. So that Makes was sense. one of the, the things. So this is something that we want to say to the communities that uh, make sure that the reference that you're using and the data that you're using is of good quality because you cannot make bold claims like that if your data is not perfect. Correct. Yes. yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. So we also say that um, sometimes um, machine translation is evaluation is not performed by professional translators because either we don't have um, money to do it or we don't have time to do it. So sometimes what is asked is for bilingual speakers who are not professional translators at all, just to rate or to uh, rank. So if I, I give them uh, three different translations of a, the same source sentence and I ask them to, say, to tell me which one is better. So what we saw is that uh, when we ask bilinguals to do it, they are more tolerant of errors than if we ask translators, of course, because translators are more... Are trained. Yes, yes. exactly. They are trained to find the errors. So what um, uh, Microsoft had done was to ask bilinguals to do it. And we asked bilinguals and translators and we saw that there was a difference there. Okay, so like there were quite uh, one or th three, uh, three or four things that we found that should be considered. Um, but I want to make it clear that it's not like Microsoft was trying to do something um, shady or anything. Yes. They followed the, the standard that we do. What we're trying to raise is that sometimes we don't pay attention that our data is not of good quality. And we cannot make such big claims if we use bilinguals and not uh, professional translators. Yes, of so, course. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Yeah, no, that's a, sort of a double, um, it's checking yeah. twice, really. Double yes, checking. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. And it's a little bit uh, complicated because these big companies, they are like the leaders on uh, translation and machine translation yeah. in the area. So for you to come and say, oh, wait, let me recheck your results is a little bit, you know. Yes. Uh, so, but we have, as, as scientists, we have to do it. And um, and the, the, the thing, the, the great thing is that Microsoft actually, they were so confident in their results uh, that they released the data so we could retest the other companies, they didn't do it. And in the end, we found that Microsoft uh, machine translation system is actually much better than it was and much better than a few other ones that we compared, mm -hmm. but it's still compared with human translation, human translation wins. Yeah, <laughs> That's fascinating. So what would you think of, um, so you're talking about the Microsoft um, machine translation system. What about other uh, well-known platforms such as uh, Google Translate, for instance? Yeah, so Google had the claim, uh, they released a paper, I think last year. It was something like, uh, bridging the gap between human and human translation and machine translation uh, i would love to do <laughs> to reassess their claims but we don't have the data they didn't release the data so i cannot uh, replicate what they've done okay but i would say that it's very unlikely that they bridged the gap <laughs> between machine and human translation but you think there's a bit more work to, i to think get there, yeah. yes there is always a bit more that we can do in a few more aspects that we can look into mm -hmm. uh, I, I would love to do it but I, we don't have the data yes. <laughs> well it'd be great yeah if they they 
they did re they they were to release the data for mm -hmm. sure yeah that would certainly be uh, something you can look into yeah. exactly <laughs> and so um and previously you've also been part of a team that worked on another project yeah the if i pronounce it correctly the tramok project Tram tramuk yes. tramuk project yeah so uh, this one was um uh, the the acronym uh, stands for translation for massive open online courses yeah. Uh, and it, it ended in January of this year. Yes. So you were providing reliable machine translation for massive open online courses, yes? Yes, that was a, a great project. Um, so the goal of the project was to build a platform with machine translation uh, that uh, people that have, you know, uh, they have their online courses, and, but generally the online courses are uh, in English. So what we wanted to do is to people be able to take those courses go to the platform, translate it automatically, and then they could release their online courses in different languages, you know, like the, the subtitles of the, those classes. Yeah. Uh, so for that project, we worked with 11 languages. And we, in the end, we were able to build uh, the, the newest neural machine translation system for uh, the MOOC platform. And uh, we they have that in the website of the project now, if you want to. Yeah, okay. So, um, but what what have you what would you say has been achieved from this project? What have you observed? What would be the main you know observation from this? Well, the main observation that we did it, because it was right in the time that machine the machine translation field was shifting from statistical machine translation to neuro machine translation. Okay. So neuro machine translation was very very new, and there hadn't been any uh, large scale evaluation and neuro machine translation. So we were the first ones to do it. So we compared, we built first a few statistical machine translation systems for um, Russian, Portuguese, German and Greek. So, you know, apart from Portuguese, all difficult languages. <laughs> yeah. And then we built uh, neuro machine translation systems for the same languages. And we compared with professional translators mm -hmm. to see if neuro machine translation was indeed uh, getting uh, better translations than the previous um, MT systems and we found that uh, for languages that machine translation wasn't very good before with, with the statistical, for example German, yeah. the neuro machine translation was uh, gaining so much more quality that we decided the, to change the project because in the beginning the project was supposed to build statistical machine translation. So in the middle of the project we decided, okay, to switch. We go, we're going to switch because neuro machine translation is, is getting so much better results. So, uh, I've, in, in my view, apart from building a platform where people can translate their uh, MOOCs, uh, the, the large-scale evaluation proving that neuro machine translation was actually uh, performing better than statistical for a, a, a large number of languages was one of the, the, the biggest things that I did in this project. Yeah. yeah. And uh, nowadays, it's still the case, and it's um, it's the case for even more languages, not just like uh, the ones that you mentioned, I suppose. Yeah. yeah, well, it really depends also in the domain, you know, like uh, I know that there are a few companies that they have their in-house rule-based machine translation systems, which is even before statistical, and they perform much better than uh, statistical and neuro uh, machine translation. So I think it depends on how long how good your data is, the data that you trained your system, um, and how specifically uh, the, the data is for a, in a specific domain, for example. There are machine translation companies that they are, um, they are specializing very specific things. Uh, so for example, let's say um, they want to uh, translate um, instruction manual for microphones, and they just work with that. And they can have like very good data of very quality and the results is even better than the ones from neuro machine translation you see so it really depends i don't want to say that neuro is better than everything else because we have seen that for some languages the other um, systems they tend to work better as well okay so it, i'm gonna say it will depend on um language pair a domain like specifically 
what area you're translating into and how long have you had time to how much data do you have on yes, that of course, yeah. you know and so we know that for uh, low resource languages rule based is better because they have very uh, little data yes and your machine translation needs loads of data yes. but they were working on that as well so i i'm 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 going to say that we're in very exciting times that everything can change at any time and we're getting good results from everywhere you know so Yes, yeah. it might change in the future, but it for might now, change, yes. yes, you might okay. change. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. And um so like to me it seems that machine translation has really always been part of your professional journey and you're I mean you started studying it and then and then you you're working with it. Uh I mean like what 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 is it that triggered such an interest? Because you you talked about it a little bit, but there must be something that <laughs> I d- I don't know. I because I always lo- liked translation and I always liked technology. I I sometimes I um like when I t- when I tell my family what I do, they don't understand, yeah. <laughs> so I say to them that I feel like I am in one of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy books because I'm working Like my head is like in 50 years ahead I want to build a system that will translate everything into anything. So I feel like I'm contributing a lot to society and, and technology and development. Seriously? So I I I feel that maybe I, you know don't get me wrong I'm doing just a little bit <laughs> but you know that's uh, I I like the 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 area I like feeling that I am doing something that um in 50 years or 100 years people will look oh the researchers on that time very old ones they they did this and that's what helped us to get into here so get where we are yes yeah. okay yeah. yes definitely and um what would you say what would you, what role would you say machine translation plays in the industry nowadays I think it's uh, a big deal. Yes. Uh so if you see there are a few reports from the Common Sense Advisory and they have these uh, statistics on how many companies have been using machine translation and if you take the reports from you know a few years ago and compare to now the numbers have been increasing a lot. So I think machine tra- and not only in the translation industry companies you know like all the other companies they have been using a lot and of course they're going to use the free uh, online uh, machine translation systems I I haven't met anyone that has never used machine translation so far you know so if you use the internet you're bound to have used machine yeah. translation at some point um there were a few days that I was coming back uh, to Dublin and uh so i am brazilian so i always have to go through immigration yes so um the um, the officers they always ask me like oh so what you do but they mm-hmm. have all the information but they ask anyway yes. and then i say oh i work with machine translation and then one said machine translation what is that and i say well Do you know the easiest way to explain? Do you know Google Translate? Yes, I do. I use it every day because there are so many people that come here and I don't understand what they're saying. So I use a Google Translation and then I say, "Well, you're welcome." <laughs> 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 so it's like it's everywhere that I go and I say that I work with, ma- with machine translation and I explain what it is. Everyone say, "Oh yeah, of course I have used." So I think it's a big deal machine translation not only in the industry but in the world that we live uh, now because it's very globalized and it's Absolutely. very yeah and it's especially if you live in a big capital that you have colleagues that you know from Iran or you know so many places and you you bound to use it at some point yes absolutely yeah and nowadays you see a lot more people traveling around the world yes. and and with and with all those technologies you know apps developing on your phone yeah. you have you know uh, i don't know and it's so helpful lingo or a word reference on Ooh. all those all those um technologies that help you communicate yeah Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um I was listening to um a a speech in a conference um and uh and, and the point was was that you know uh, nowadays you'd have um you, you can't really go past those and and you'd have those apps on your phone where where you you can say something and show it to the person if you yeah. don't speak their language which I found fascinating uh which 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 shows that you Yeah, you 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 basically can travel on your own. You yeah. know, it opens as well so many other doors. There's uh, so many things that you know can be achieved. It through, is yeah. it is very true because yeah. like 
if if you travel in a country that you kind of even if you don't like for example if you go to I, I don't speak German so if I go to to Germany I don't speak the language but I kind of can I can read the name of places because the alphabet is you know is the same yeah so you kind of figure out a little bit but like when you go to a place like uh, I was in in Hong Kong a few weeks ago absolutely I couldn't understand anything so the thing that helped me out was machine translation you know um, so for me that uh, I need that to travel and I travel uh, a lot because of work without machine translation it would be so much worse <laughs> <laughs> I suppose yeah I suppose a lot of us would be lost yeah yeah um, which I think yeah is why um, uh, translation uh, uh, learning languages in general is very important it is very important um, yeah. so um, So we talked about the human skill and about achieving parity uh, with machine translation. So what would you say? Would you say that the human skill will ever be like unnecessary, like in the future? No, I don't think so. I think we always going to need translators. We always going to need very good translators because um, machine translation cannot exist without human translation. Because you see, remember I said that um, some of the data that we got, the reference was not good. So if the reference is not good, and if we train a system on a translation that is not very good, the system will also give a translation that is not very good. So we need translators from beginning to end of any machine translation systems. We need translators to provide very high quality translations so we can train the system. We need translators to tell us in the middle of building the system what's wrong with that what kind of errors the machine is is making uh, what's not working what is working so then we can use that to retrain everything and then we need translators to tell the final uh, the quality of the final product we need translators all the time <laughs> i need translators all the time <laughs> i need to have more translators friends <laughs> um, And in the future, what what I'm asked a lot is if translators will be abs obsolete in the future. And I say that it's absolutely not that there is no way that we're not going to need translators. You know, um, what I think that maybe is going to happen is that like ha like what happened with translation memories when translation memories was um, introduced for the translation workflow in companies. Many people were scared that um, that would mean that they wouldn't need translators anymore because you know you you keep all the translations that were done and then you just retrieve it. But we see that that was not true. Translation memory is just a tool that the translators use yeah. to not, you know, If, if I've already translated that sentence, I don't need to do that again. So I, I get read of yes. repetitions, yeah. you know. So machine translation for me, it's exactly the same thing. Uh, it's a tool that translators can use to get read of the things that it's it's easy enough because a machine can do it. And then the translators will come with the creativity on the top of that to correct the task, text or to make it better or even, you know, moving forward uh, to more creative texts, for example. So I don't think we, we're not gonna need translators. We're gonna need more, more, more translators. More translators, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I suppose um, languages overall as well are changing and you're having, you know, new words being introduced every day as well. Yes. So that in every language, in every, whether it's a language on two different continents, for exactly. instance. There'll be two different, yeah, two words for, um, for the same word really so, exactly yeah, so. exactly you're completely right and um it, it's it's not only that but like new texts are, are created a new like you say new expressions and everything and uh the world that we live uh, today is so we like we have to have everything everything translated if the company wants to sell the product in another country so we need to make sure that the translation is of high good quality and high good quality is professional translators and yeah, so of course yeah so this kind of links to like um to what i wanted to ask you later about the future of translation so we agree that we will need translators forever that's yeah. a fact do you see anything else coming technology wise any new kind of technology or processes or that could be involved I see that I what I can see what we already have is going to be a mix of technologies 
together with machine translation. So, for example, uh, before speech recognition, you know, when you speak and um, the machine can write down what you have, it was not connected to machine translation before, but now you have so many time, uh, types of apps that you can speak your language and then it translates into the other. So that's not just machine translation, that's a speech recognition because the phone has to recognize your voice yes. and then it translates that into a text and the text go to the machine translation which translates into the other language in text and then the app has to read the text in a voice. So, you know, so it's like a bunch of technologies together. So I think that's gonna happen more and more. So technologies that we didn't think that would match mm -hmm. together with machine translation, I think we're gonna find a way to match them <laughs> together. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that the future is uh, very um, science fiction-like, like we're gonna have loads of everything together and we're gonna be able to make a choice if we want you know, uh, what we want uh, with machine translation or not. So I'm very excited. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds very exciting, yeah. Uh, it certainly, uh, yeah, it certainly uh, looks uh, very promising for a lot of um, a lot of companies and uh, the translation uh, industry in general. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, um, I suppose this is kind of what you observed um, since you started your research, because, I mean, you've worked since you, you've done your master's, you've done your postgraduate, yeah. you've done, um, uh, you've done, uh, you've, you've, you've published a lot of papers on the topic. I did. <laughs> so what would be your main, observ if you had to make one observation? Okay, well, I think the main observation is that um, machine translation uh, evolves every time that there is um, the hardware, the computer hardware evolves as well. So um, machine translation is started as a rule-based system so which is uh, for people that are not um, acquainted with it is you write rules on how to translate from one language to the other and you give that to the machine and then after that we moved and then there was this big leap that we moved from rule based to statistical machine translation which basically we just need needed loads of data and the machine would look into um, a window of words and try to match that with you know with the um, the source and the reference and that was a big um, thing you know in the machine translation field and everyone was very excited and then we kind of reached a little bit of a ceiling with that and uh, we felt like we needed we needed a little bit we, we needed to go forward we needed a breakthrough and then a few years ago uh, the hardware uh, computers they developed and they became more powerful so then we were able to develop an idea of neuro machine translation which was given a few years ago yeah. but our computers were not powerful enough to they do were it not ready yet, yes. so the idea was there so when we had this powerful uh, you know uh, hardware we said you know scientist says okay you know what i'm gonna try that again and it worked and now we have a breakthrough with neuro machine translation so we're in a very exciting times right now because we just made uh, the, the this discovery um, i'm saying like air quotes here yeah, yeah, discovery yeah, yeah, yeah. because um now we need to learn everything that we already knew about uh, statistical machine translation we have to figure out about neuro machine translation so in a statistical machine translation we kind of know what type of errors it makes from uh, different language pairs like in, uh, for example um, my mother tongue is portuguese so i know what type of errors statistical makes for portuguese but we kind of don't know the errors that neuro does for portuguese so you know so there is this whole thing of research that is open right now and by the time we reach the ceiling of that that mm -hmm. we learned everything i am pretty sure there's going to be another breakthrough yes because we're going to have a better hardware as well and then maybe we're going to change for something else you know or maybe we're just gonna take all the types of machine translations that we have and we're just going to put all them together in just one and we're gonna make this uh, other machine, machine yeah. system. <laughs> or yeah. maybe we're just gonna forget about all of these and there's gonna be a new one but what I, I am 
very convinced is that there's always going to be a breakthrough in science because we the scientists we never stop looking for a breakthrough yes, so it's course. it's bound to happen at some point but it's exciting it means there's always, always something to to look for yeah. and uh, i think that's that's one when you asked me what is it that i like about it i think that's it the excitement that there's always something new that i can do and look for yeah. you know it's, it's always very challenging of to course, do it yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I just had a little question um, coming back to your other experiences. As um, I, I, I see that you you worked as a supervisor in a summer internship on sarcasm translation, and I'm yes. very curious about it. What does sarcasm translation mean? Uh, you see, uh, we're still trying to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> we have a few um, colleagues. There is a, a big area on sarcasm detection. Not only sarcasm, but like uh, irony and hate speech and this kind of things. Because um, a company need they need to uh, go through the reviews of the customers and see if the the customers like the product or not. Um, But th this is an example. So, for example, if I buy, um, I don't know, a car and I go give a review of it and, then I, and I hate the car and then I say, oh, yeah, this is amazing because I got the car broke down two days after I yeah, bought it. I and see. But you see, because I say this is amazing, some systems will get that as a positive review. But because I have... Um, a positive thing and a negative thing just after that, that's sarcasm. So that's very hard to detect. Even humans, if you give a few sarcastic sentences to humans, they sometimes they are not able to detect if yes. it's sarcastic or not. Yes, absolutely. Yeah? So if you use Twitter, sometimes you get like, was that Twitter sarcastic or not? You Sometimes you can, you're not very sure. Yeah. So what we were trying to do with the sarcasm translation is that there was Uh, a corpus. So a corpus is a collection of uh, sentences or texts. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a corpus that was uh, called um, um, sign corpus, which was a collection of sarcastic tweets. But it was not only the sentence, uh, they, they asked a few, um, pe I don't know if they're translators or not, we, they asked a few people to Uh, come up with uh, five explanations of the sarcasm. So we wanted to translate that to be able to build a machine translation that was going to translate sarcasm well, because, you know, um, machine translation systems for now, they're not very good to handle uh, mm -hmm. figurative languages and yes. creative texts. So yes. what we wanted to do is to first create the data for that, mm -hmm. so translate to have the corpus that was in English translated into French. So we wanted to build a machine translation system that, and then we wanted to try if if, if it would work with sarcastic um, Comment, sentences yeah. or not. Yeah, so, but for that internship, uh, my intern only uh, built the corpus so far. So we still don't have results <laughs> <laughs> on that, but it was very, very interesting thing to do because yeah. even for us, when we looked at some So, so the the translator was doing the, the translation and she couldn't find sometimes an equivalent into French. Yes. Because she's like, but this doesn't sound sarcastic. And I was like, well, but it is in English. Like, well, but in French it wouldn't be. It was like, well, how's that possible? So you see, so it's very difficult for humans to do it. So uh, we want to teach the machine to do that as well but we have to figure out how we, we do it first. <laughs> yes, how you do it, yeah, no, it totally makes sense. So. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, and I suppose you'll be, you'll be developing maybe some, some other type of, uh, of translation, such as irony, as you were saying. Yes, and yes, we want to, that, that's one of the things that I, I am trying to look more into now, is to look into more uh, creative, um, no, I'm not going to say creative, I'm going to say uh, figurative languages, so metaphors, sarcasm and, and so on. Ambiguity. Ambiguity is a very big problem for machine translation because for now machine translation translates sentence by sentence. So for example, if um, in English we don't have um, Uh, sometimes, for example, the the pronoun "eat" doesn't have a gender, right? Yeah. But in some other languages, they do. So, especially Latin languages. So, if for, give an example of my language, if I say like um, the microphone is blue, yes, in one sentence, 
and then in the other sentence I say it is also very heavy. If translates into uh, Portuguese, there is a chance that the it will be translated into the wrong gender. Uh, gender. So that's an ambiguity and an afra that we have to fix. So that's one of the kind of things that I'm going to try to look more in my future research is how can we fix this problem of uh, ambiguity in, in language and try to teach the machine to handle that better. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's it's, it's fascinating. Um, I uh, um, I encounter I've encountered this problem myself. Um, um, being French myself, I've encountered this problem. Of, uh, I, I used to teach um, I used to teach French to um, a young lady who was taking her GCSEs in the UK, and she's asked me one day. She said, Priscilla. How, how can I ever know if if this word is is masculine or feminine? And I say, well, yeah. there's no rule. Unfortunately, yeah. you have to you have to learn it. Exactly, it is. It, is, it can be and quite even between yeah. Latin languages. Yes. You say like sometimes I would say um, there was I I, I can I can remember now, but there was a word in Portuguese that was uh, I think um, bed in French. Li is yeah masculine. Yes. And I couldn't understand why it was masculine because in Portuguese it's feminine, and I, and I was like, that doesn't make absolutely no sense because it's a bed, it's a feminine, it's something cozy that you lie on, like a mom, you know? It's like no, 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 no way, this is masculine. <laughs> so if we we have this difficulty, imagine yeah. the machine because the machines are stupid, you know, machine machines do whatever we tell them to do so if we have that difficulty the machine won't, won't, take, won't make it either yeah so no it definitely makes sense yeah yeah and uh, so would would those be part of the project that you might be working on in the future or is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience that you'd be working on yeah well for now i'm still working the i adapt uh, project until next year and uh, for uh, the for the for the years after that, I'm really looking into working with more, uh, like I say, figurative languages. Mm -hmm. And another thing that I, I am trying to do is to uh, move forward the machine translation evaluation field because um, right now what we tend to do is to evaluate sentence by sentence and sometimes we give randomized sentence to translators which makes absolutely no sense because you need a context to uh, be able to translate properly to translate properly Absolutely. and to evaluate properly yeah. so i'm going to try uh, i'm i'm going to i'm going to work more on uh, we call it document level uh, evaluation so i'm going to try to um, I'm going to try to make more experiments on that so I can give translators more context and we can, uh, you know, evaluate in a real world scenario where you have the, the full text. Um, it's it's a little bit challenging because like we cannot, if you, for example, if you're translating um, a book, what what is a document level? Is as much you, you can fit on, on the screen or yeah. is it two paragraphs or is it one paragraph? We don't know. So this is something, you see, so every time that we try to modify some kind of thing, we have to go to the very beginning. So if I want to do, to give more context to a translator to be able to evaluate one translation, I have to understand how much context is necessary. So I have to go from the beginning. So yeah. that's why it takes a while to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but understand. yeah, but th these are my, my new uh, focus in the, in the near future. That's brilliant. Okay, well, um, Sheila, it's been an absolute pleasure, really, really thankful Thank to have you here. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for your time. And um, and thanks for sharing um, all the work, the great work that you do. It's, it's very useful to all of us. <laughs> <laughs> it's all my pleasure. I hope I haven't uh, talked too much. I tend to talk <laughs> a lot sometimes. <laughs> no, it's great. It, it's really fascinating. So um, so that's the end for uh, of today's show with uh, Sheila Castillo from the ADAPT Centre Dublin. Please tune in again to see the next Vista Talk show where we'll be discussing more interesting discussions with interesting people from around the world. <laughs>